Hi YouTube and welcome to my channel. What if I told you that you could deploy all your servers, all your services, with the click of a button? Well, that's what we're going to look at here today. Let me show you what I mean. Alright, so we're going to talk about infrastructure as code today. So what we're going to do is clear the screen and then we're going to CD into my into my code folder. So this is the folder that contains the code needed to deploy a server. So we're going to go into the deploy folder and then plans list, you know, into the OpenSUSE folder list. Okay, so here's how this works. Let's say I want to deploy a new OpenSUSE server. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit the vars.tf file you see right there. I'm going to make a change. So let's say instead of four CPU cores, we just want two. So there we go, just write that, and then we're going to git add vars.tf, git commit, do it, and then git push. All right, so what's going on here? So you saw that as soon as I pushed that change to the code, something started happening. Now what's going on here is it is actually taking that code that I wrote and it's using it to deploy a server, and all I had to do was edit the code. That's it. All I had to do was edit it, and now it is going in and it's deploying the server the way that I defined. Okay, so let's back up here and let me give you a little bird's eye view. So what happened is we wrote a Terraform plan, we pushed it to the get server, and then the server was automatically created. That is all there is to it. So I hope this kind of gets your wheels turning, right? You hopefully, hopefully you've seen this and you've thought to yourself, oh, that can solve a lot of problems. Let's talk about that. So this infrastructure's code idea solves a couple serious problems in business. Uh, first of all, it's configuration drift. So what happens with servers and stuff over time, people change the settings, people tweak stuff, and then it becomes uh, very unique. And what happens is you have to replace that now unique thing every once in a while, and you never get it back to the point where it was at before. Uh, so infrastructure's code solves this idea, or solves this problem. So essentially, if you do all of your configuration and deployments of your servers and stuff in code, and then you, if you need to make a change, you just make that change in the code, and then it just automatically changes it for you, uh, that prevents configuration drift. And let's, let's I, I want to point out, servers don't last forever. Every server will have to be replaced eventually. So what are you going to do when it's time to replace an important one? Well, you're going to spend hours and hours and hours trying to get it back to the same point that it was at before. And it's never going to get there. There's always going to be something different with the new one compared to the old one, unless you're using infrastructure's code. With infrastructure's code, all I would have had to do was change the IP address that the server is going to be deployed at, and it would just create a new one with the exact same settings, exact same everything for me. And look, this doesn't have to be complicated or fancy. I would highly recommend doing this in your home lab, uh, if you don't have a home lab, go in your closet, grab an old laptop, grab an old computer, doesn't have to be fancy, doesn't have to be expensive, plug that sucker in, put a server operating system on it, and just start learning. Seriously, if you're trying to get into IT, then one of the most important things that you can start learning today is infrastructure as code. It makes you more valuable to your business. Okay, so how, how does all of this actually work? Well, it's actually quite simple. I have a git repo that is open right here. And you can see we have a couple files and folders and stuff in here. So basically, we're going to look at the modules first. So what's going on here is I have the actual deployment plans in one folder. And then I have modules in a folder next to it. Why are those separate? Well, you can do it all in one file. That's valid. However, if you're going to be doing lots of deployments, then you're going to be copying a lot of code. And let's say you need to make a change to all of the stuff you deployed. 
Well, now you have to go in and do it one by one. If you make a module, so basically you take all of that code that you would repeat over and over again, you put it in the module, and now if you need to make a change across the board, you update the module, and it pushes out to all servers. It's that simple. So let's look at the modules here. We just have one folder called Linux, uh, and then we have two files in here. These are Terraform files. Uh, so this is main.tf, so let's take a look at that. All right, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail. This isn't a tutorial on how to use Terraform. I'm just trying to get you familiar with the ideas of infrastructure as code. Uh, so basically, this is saying that it's going to use Proxmox because that is the virtualization platform that I use. And then you can see here it's got some variables. Uh, all, the dot va all the var dot lines, those are all variables. Uh, so you can see we have the token ID and the token secret, right? Pretty basic stuff. Uh, essentially what's going on here is in order to create a new server on the server for me, it has to have a secret, a password that the server can use to authenticate. Uh, so if we go down here, basically we're just making a new Linux VM. Uh, we're just going to make one of them is what it says here. And then you can see if we did make more than one, this little bit of code right here would actually allow it to give each one a different name. And then we have a bunch of variables. Uh, so what's going on with these variables? Well, if we get out of this and go back to my git repo folder, if we look into the plans folder, and then I just have one in here, open SUSE, you can see we have SUSE.tf, that's a Terraform file, and then we have vars.tf. I'm going to look at vars.tf. So this is where all the variables that are unique to this deployment go. So what, what would happen is if I wanted to make a new server, all I would have to do is copy these two files, make a new folder here, call it something like SUSE2, or SUSE3, I guess. So all I'd have to do is copy these files, right? Go back, pop that in there. Just copy those two files, and then I would just have to change the variables to give it a unique name, tweak it however I need it to be set up, and that's all I have to do as soon as I push that change to the Git repo, it will automatically deploy that server for me. All right, so what's going on under the hood here, right? You, you're probably familiar with Git, so if you've been following along, you'll see that I just have a Git server and a virtual machine in my home lab. Uh, so what's actually doing the automation, though? What's making this automatically deploy stuff? Well, if we uh, just go up a couple directories here, and do a list of all the hidden files, you'll see there's this git folder. So we're gonna go into the git folder, and then we have this hooks folder. So essentially what's going on here is git has the ability to execute code depending on different things happening. So what I've done is I've created a post receive git hook. So what that means is once the server receives the code that I push up to it, it's going to execute some commands. So I just want to take a look at the post receive file that I created. This is super simple. Uh, so basically, it uh, executes this script. That's all it does, is it runs this script. So let's go take a look at that script. Uh, so that is this test.sh file that I have here. So we just do vim, pop that in, and open it. This is where all the magic really happens, right? Uh, so basically, the first problem that we have to tackle is figuring out what, what file got updated. So this first command here goes through the repo and it figures out what the most up recently updated file was. Then it goes into that directory containing that file. And then what it will do is it will run Terraform commands to initialize, validate, and apply the Terraform code and then it cleans up after itself. Uh, again, if you want to take a closer look at that, I'm going to put all my code in the comment in the uh, in a link in the description below. So that was a quick look into how you can integrate DevOps ideas into your home lab. I highly recommend that you get in your home lab, 
and you start deploying everything this way. Once you get used to it, take it to you, take it to your business because there's real value in doing things this way. Once you have this set up, it is effort to get it set up, but once you have it set up, you will save so much time. You will save the business so much cost in labor, so much cost in headache. It really pays for itself in dividends over time. Anyway, that was my video for today. My name is Patrick, I hope you enjoyed. If you like this kind of content, feel free to hit the subscribe button. I've been trying to post more regularly. And if you have any questions, leave a comment down below. I'm happy to chat with you. Anyway, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks for watching.